Um, so our next speaker is going to be Josh Fector, and uh, this guy is the king of LinkedIn. I think all of you have seen one of his LinkedIn status updates. He's had over 100 million views. Um, <clears throat> Josh, one, one thing I do want to promote on your behalf is the BAMF Facebook group, because I, you know, like, you, like Zuckerberg said, <laughs> that it's the best Facebook group on Facebook for entrepreneurs. Why don't you talk about that for a second? So we've been running this group for the last two years, maybe two and a half years now. And it was before our agency started. And it started as just 10 people who just wanted to write growth hacking guides. And it turns out that I was the only one who was going to write growth hacking guides on a consistent basis. And it wanted to be our little secret. And it turned out that a lot of people actually needed this material. And some founders found out. And then a lot of marketers found out and they're like, wow, this is a place where we can geek out online. And it's the first community that's actually available for marketers. That's not like inbound on HubSpot, right? Something that's like live and thriving. And that little community today has over 20,000 members. And we've been invited to go to the Facebook community summit. That's where we got to meet Mark Zuckerberg. It's a really incredible event. We actually took one of the members with us and did a giveaway to do it. So... Yeah, if you want the best marketing tactics, go to that group. We try to come out with several new growth hacks every single week. I'm actually talking about the process today of how do you come up with great marketing ideas. So, so much of it is a mindset and not a lot of people know that. And it's basically, today I'll be taking everything you know about traditional marketing and flipping it on its head. So, why marketing is physics. Now, many people don't know this, but physics is built in principles, right? And principles don't change over time. And copywriting 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, is the same as copywriting today. Uh, but people just package it differently. And they say, this is what it looks like today. And then if you break it down, you're like, but people have been doing this for millions of years, right? Um, and so one of the cool things is that once you understand marketing and then you understand that it's built on principles, you realize that... You don't have to go out and learn tons of new things. You don't have to go out and follow bloggers. You don't have to go out and follow whoever it is you're getting your marketing material from. I actually don't read anyone's work. And people just follow my work. And I find that really fascinating because um, if you always follow somebody, you're never actually going to become a leader, right? That's how leadership works. And when that hit me, I was like, okay, well, don't I have to follow somebody to get the latest marketing material? Well, the truth is I didn't. So I'm going to start off with a funny story. Now, there's a lot of big name companies up here, and they all have a common theme. So when uh, I was a VP of marketing for a mobile app startup that was basically matching people to jobs, similar to like Tinder or Swipe feature, ended up failing. We had raised 500K off a viral Reddit post. Horrible idea. Never do that. Make sure you actually have sales before you raise any money. Um, and then that startup died in around six months looking for a job and interviewed at these four companies. So each of these companies had around 20 people on their team at the time. And almost all these companies are worth a billion dollars today. And the cool part about it is actually none of them hired me. <laughs> so I was like, wow, that's pretty brutal. So what ended up happening was, is I went back home, uh, was basically surfing in my car for a month trying to get a job in marketing, but no one wanted to hire me because I came from a couple of failed startups. And I said, how can I get out of this mess? You know, what don't I know? And that's when I realized that desperation breeds potential. So it's when you're hopeless and you're like, I need to do anything is when you actually take that risk and you say, okay, I'm going to do something that's really drastic that I've never done before. And hopefully it changes my life. And for some of us, it doesn't. For some of us, it does. And I was fortunate enough to where that action really changed my life. And... That was as simple as picking up books. So over the next year, I read close to, I think it was 150 books and about business, psychology, and marketing. And when I was doing this, I came across the same principles over and over again. And I started looking at the internet in different ways than most people do. And most people look at the internet and it just confuses them. They're like, okay, you have Facebook, you have Instagram, you have Snapchat, et cetera, et cetera, right? And I just started tuning things out. Like just pause, you know, move it to the side. And when I was going through all these books and reading a lot of biographies, I came across something remarkable. And that is, who are the best marketers in the world? And I started reading, you know, 
material from Seth Godin. Is this Seth Godin? You know, the answer is actually no, it's not Seth Godin. And it's actually the people who you least likely think are the best marketers. So people like Martin Luther King, right? Martin Luther King, before the internet even existed, was able to bring an incredible movement that changed the world, right? He didn't even have the internet. And yet we depend on the internet. Most of us feel like we have to, to make change in the world, right? So why did Martin Luther King succeed? Why did Gandhi succeed, right? Why did these people succeed without the internet? What were they doing that companies today don't do, that marketers today have no understanding of? Well, it's actually quite simple. So one is they documented everything. So Martin Luther King, his two people that he idolized almost more than anybody else was Gandhi. So when he was in seminary school, he read, I think it was 10 books on Gandhi's life. And then he also idolized Leo Tolstoy. And many of you guys probably don't know Tolstoy, but he's one of the most famous Russian authors to ever exist. The dude is incredible. And it turns out that Gandhi was heavily influenced by Tolstoy's work as well. And they all had this common pattern. I was studying their common pattern. I said, okay, well, they write a lot. When Gandhi went to jail, what did he do every day in jail? He wrote. When Martin Luther King sat down every day, what did he do? He wrote. And same with Tolstoy. So they were putting out work constantly. So in the publications that existed long time ago, they were just putting out content in the written form constantly, documenting their journey the entire way, right? So similar to how Brianna talked about documenting her journey, that's what these people were doing every step along the way. Before we had Instagram, they were just doing it through writing. And this is how I've done it. So I've done it through writing a number of books. We actually have a couple of these books coming out in print this month, which I'm super stoked about. Um, and I've been documenting my journey for the last five years, just putting it out in publications. Now I write on our personal blog, on LinkedIn, Facebook. And many people say, you know, how do you build this great audience? And I say, it's as simple as writing every day and just saying, this is what I did. This is what I learned. But it's hard if you actually didn't do anything fascinating, if you actually didn't learn anything. So how do you learn new things? How do you do things that are fascinating? You have to focus on creating. Now, there's a big mindset that people can't get rid of, and that's a consumer mindset. It's the idea that we have to read the next marketing blog post. I have to know what's going on in politics today to change the world. Now, one of my best friends who I met in college, who gave me some of the worst and best advice of my life, the worst advice was that startup life is going to be easy. And he was, his first startup that he worked for, he was making six figures in the first three months. And they were a rocket ship. And I thought that was what startup life was like. I was like, dude, you get in there and you make a ton of money. Turns out the first eight startups I worked for all failed. Super brutal. I was like, this guy is a total bullshitter, right? <laughs> but he did tell me one thing that really resonated. He was a great rock climber and he said, you need to adopt the mentality of a rock climber. What can you change around you? A rock climber has, let's say, three feet around them, right? And if you want to change what's around you, you can't be thinking of things that are on the TV, things that are so distant from you. Uh, you have to think of what's in your possession, right? Because all you really have. Now, you may be able to look at something on TV, and so let's say it's about politics, and you go rant on, you know, wherever it is on a Facebook post and be like, yeah, there you go. But you're not really adding any value. You know, you're not really creating anything. So first step is to take away as much pointless consumption as possible and think like, like a rock climber, right? So what I did is I said, how can I do this online? So I created some Chrome extensions that blocked out all my news feeds. Then I adopted every Chrome extension that basically prevented me from going to any site that would destroy my productivity. And I said, you know, what will happen when I do this? Well, it turns out this is what I see every day. So I see a space that says you can write something. And I said, okay, well, what can I write? And that's when it hit me. It's hard to create, right? It's not only hard to create, but when you force yourself to do something like that, you start eating away at old habits, right? Old routines that built you into a consuming machine, and now you're becoming a creator. 
So I can sit down today and maybe in 15 minutes write a post that has such good copy in it that people will just message me and be like, I don't know how you do that, right? And it's because this is what I see every day. And that's how I became a creator. And one of the things I also learned is that you don't have to engage with other people's content, right? You don't have to like other people's photos. That real relationships are built through conversation. And as simple as that sounds, it's sort of scary to a lot of people. We're used to going through our Facebook newsfeed, Instagram newsfeed, and liking things. Now, how many messages do you send for every post you like? I guarantee you, you probably like 100 posts for every message you send. That's how bad we are creating relationships online. It's crazy, right? So I said, okay, well, I'm not going to like anybody else's content. And what's going to happen? Are they even going to like mine? Are they going to notice? Well, it turns out they don't notice, right? Now, I like to give the example that you have the guy who, um, and I see some of my employees do this, and uh, I'm not going to name any names, but I see them looking on Instagram and they're checking, you know, let's say this girl that they really like. And they're like, I hope she noticed the 700s liked on her photo. And, and this comment I'm going to put there too. And I'm like, dude, like, stop doing this. Just message her, right? If you like her. Um, <laughs> and it's so funny because that's what social media has brought us today. It's so much consuming. And as I like to say, almost like action that's really in action at the sacrifice of our relationships. And if you just focus on building relationships, you'd realize how much time you have in your day. So stop liking things and start messaging. So I even did this on, you know, across other platforms. Even put it in my own quote there because I thought it was hilarious. Um, <laughs> so when I was going through this process, I said, okay, Gandhi and Martin Luther King, what's so magical about what they do besides writing? Well, it's a skill that compounds. How long does it compound for? How long can you write for? You can write for as long as you live, pretty much as long as you have hands. How long can you code in a certain language, right? How long is that language going to exist? Sometimes a lot of languages don't exist forever. And a lot of what you do actually becomes outdated, especially in the tech world. So the most famous marketers all relied on the same two skills. Look at Gary Vee today, right? Writing, speaking. Why? Because you can improve that throughout your entire lifetime. It is the best compounding skill that exists. That means if I invest in writing today, and today I'm 27 years old, and I've, let's say I live to 87, I have 60 years more of benefit. 60 years, right? Now, there's a ton of things I can invest in, like let's say messenger chatbots, right? We do messenger chatbots, but you know, let's say for the sake of a skill, and now Messenger Chatbots doesn't exist in five years. You know, it doesn't compound as well, right? And you want to build those deep T's if you want to become a great marketer. If you can't write as a marketer, you are not a marketer. If you can't give an eloquent speech as a marketer, you are not a marketer. So what are your deep T's? Now, this is actually really funny because creativity is derived from your deep T's. And it's usually when two of them come together. So, for example, I have a pretty technical background, and I also love writing, and I know how to build sales funnels. So I got these deep T's. A T is a skill. So it's a skill like writing, video production, whatever it may be. And the part above the T is everything you're just okay at, right? But if you can get a couple more deep T's of those coming down, you can find very creative touch points to combine them together, and that's when innovation occurs. And I'm going to show you how we are able to do that um, with some of the work that we're doing. But first, I'm going to show you a really funny example. So what is a deep tea here? Well, if anybody knows the story behind Snapchat, it actually started when they were trying to figure out how to create an app where they can send basically you know, very promiscuous photos and get them to be erased, right? So we had a deep tea in fraternity life, right? <laughs> and he started off with that first deep tea. He's like, I know a lot about fraternity life. Um, and the story goes that they're, I think they were pretty smashed at the time as well, which is pretty funny. And then he also had a deep tea with his co-founder who had a 
background technology, right? So two deep T's. And you combine those together to create Snapchat. And sometimes it doesn't have to be your deep T, right? It can be your co-founder as well. And that's when you really start to understand how to put all the right pieces around you. So what I like to say um, is MVP it, right? If you have great skills in a couple of areas and you can combine them together to create something, is it going to work? I don't know. Most ideas don't work, but what you can do is at least test it. And we test ideas constantly and we don't do it through the regular method of build it first, right? We always pre-sell. That's actually how Banff Media was started. You know, today we have close to 30 employees and how I was able to bootstrap it was I left my job and I met this guy named Brian Smith. He runs what's called the Founders Organization, one of the largest founder organizations in the world. Super smart guy. He says, people trust you. You can sell anything. He's like, just sell something next week, Monday, do it. And I was like, what am I going to sell? I have no idea, right? So basically, just put up a Facebook post. I said, if you want to connect with 1,000 or 6,000 CMOs, VCs, whoever it is, I can teach you how to do that. If you want the proposal, drop a comment below. And I got 250 comments. I had no proposal. I had to make the proposal that night, right? And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, this is crazy. What did I just do, right? So I sent out these 250 proposals. I get on a number of sales calls. And over the next two weeks, I figure it out. How do I connect with these people at scale, right? And what ends up happening is that single Facebook post, along with another Facebook post in our group, brings us to 20K MRR. So it's 20K in recurring revenue every month through a membership. And that all got launched in two weeks. And now I'm thinking, I'm like, wow, I just built a business off a Facebook post. Like, that's crazy. Who is this guy that told me to do it? He's like this, you know, mystic. I got to go back to him and give me, a, give me some magic beans. <laughs> so this is an example of a software product that we recently created. So it's a software to help writers author books faster. What's the common theme among all these testimonials? They're all fake. <laughs> so none of these testimonials are real. And that's the, I first, I created the sales funnel for the product, ran Google AdWords to it, and people purchased. The product didn't even exist. I just refunded them afterwards, right? Because I didn't want to spend two years building a product that nobody would buy. And as soon as we started seeing a good CAC and we're like, okay, people are purchasing it at a cost that we can rock and roll with, let's go and build it. And what's hilarious about this story is the guy I started with the company with, brilliant engineer. And one of his co-founders was actually a professor at Stanford. I'm not going to name any names, but, and then we had a couple of other brilliant engineers on board and they had built this AI product for writers and they thought it was going to change the world. And the truth was that was not the case. They had spent two years building a product that they had done no validation for. They brought me on as advisor. First thing I tell them is you have built a product for yourselves. You don't even have the word writing in any of your copy and you're selling this to writers. And I told them to remove almost their entire product and start from scratch. The entire team quit except one person. Today, we have a product that I can actually sell. And that's five months later. All because we took away everything that they had and brought it down to simple question, will people pay for this? So, <laughs> as I like to say, if you sell before you build, people may get upset. You still can't really give a shit about what they think you're going to do it this way. Because the truth is, there's going to be a lot of hate that comes at you and you have to rock and roll with it because it's, if you build a company from getting validation from 20 fake sales and that company does, let's say, helps 1,000, maybe you know, 10,000 writers author books, was it worth it? Fuck yeah, it was worth it. So another thing, let your ideas fail. Most people think I'm actually like super, super successful and I've always been that way. They just don't see everything that fails, right? I remember when I was a growth evangelist for Autopilot. Autopilot was one of the fast growing marketing automation companies. And I had this great idea to them. Well, at least at the time I thought it was great. I go to them and I say, we should start another Facebook group. The Facebook group I have right now is doing so well. Let's do one for sales. And 
I'm just going to crush it just as well. And he says, don't, please don't do that. And I tell him, I, you know, I look at the CMO and I say, I'm going to do it anyways. And he's just like, oh, I fucking hate this kid. <laughs> so I end up doing it and it, oh, I think we got it. Yeah. So, and it bombs because I have zero bandwidth and I'm just guessing, right? And that's all I'm really doing. I'm just guessing faster and validating my ideas faster. And the worst thing that you can go through is having an idea and never getting it out because maybe if I had never actually done it, I'd be thinking for the whole year, the sales Facebook group is the best idea the entire year, even though it's totally worthless idea, right? And that's what most people go through. They just hold that idea in their head forever. And I was talking to a really awesome woman entrepreneur just yesterday. She started this company called Flightographer. And she was talking about how she had this idea in her head for nine months before she started it. And all she kept thinking about while she was working, and she was working at Microsoft too. It was cool. And, um, and then when she finally quit and went with the idea, and so many people told her no, that the idea was crazy, that photographers, that you couldn't get them on demand to go and take a shoot, right? How simple of an idea is that? And yet nobody believed in it. And then it took off. And now she's doing, I think, around maybe $7 million in AR, which is pretty incredible. So you got to go through a lot of ideas. And the faster you go through ideas, the faster you'll get to one that works. And you don't need to put a lot of time into it. You just need to set up a great landing page and a great payment page. I like to say, if you want to be a great business co-founder, you can literally just know how to set up a great landing page, payment page, get validation. Everybody will think you're a genius. You're like, I can already get customers. You know, this is going to be easy to recruit a developer. And you'd be surprised how easy it is to get people on your team once people know that people actually pay for your product and you can get customers. It's a game changer. Trying to convince people when you're building something, I've been building this for a year. I need someone to join me to make it work, right? And you're like, man, I feel sort of bad for this guy. Like he's been putting so much time to this product and you know, it doesn't even have an audience. Um, and you're trying to get validation, right? You go up to people and you're like, hey, do you think you would buy this? Like I put two years into it. It's, it's so much effort. And they're like, God, I feel really bad for this guy. So just say yes. You know? And they say yes. And they're like, cool. I, I, I'm going to get some customers. It's going to happen. The world doesn't work that way, right? So one of the things that we pride ourselves on is most ideas that we do is, are not original. They're actually just far better. There are already Facebook groups that existed. The only difference between our Facebook group and other Facebook groups is that it's ran better. There's other entrepreneur Facebook groups, but we still maintain ourselves as the best. And the reason for that is, is just because we apply a set of different principles, right? Physics, it's principles, it's not marketing techniques. And it's funny because a lot of the traction channels that we see are so obvious. So one of the things that a lot of people know me for is I went and racked up 200 million views on LinkedIn in the span of around nine months. And I had just posted stories in the status feed on LinkedIn. And people thought that was remarkable. So LinkedIn has existed for, let's say, 10 years, right? And nobody thinks to post a story in the status feed. Like, how crazy is that? People have been seeing this every day. Millions and millions of people. And you're talking about maybe a billion impressions to that status feed. Maybe 7 billion impressions to the status feed. And not one decides to write a story. And all of a sudden, I just start writing stories regularly and it changes the way people think about the entire LinkedIn platform. And all these star stories start going viral, right? And then all of a sudden, I go from you know, 1,000 followers on LinkedIn to 60,000 in span of nine months. And people are like, he must be a brilliant marketer. And I'm not doing anything brilliant. I'm just documenting my life in an area that people haven't before, right? So there's so many opportunities that are very easily available that we just look over every day. And sometimes 7 billion of us look over it before someone's like, hey, why don't I just put a story right here? So this is the software that's our competitor. And I take a picture here because they're a desktop app. And guess how many customers they have? 600,000 customers. Guess how big of a team they have? They have five people on their team. And guess why no one's entered the market, right? Just because they weren't able to set up a payment page, a landing page, get some social validation, run some ads, and do some basic marketing, right? We didn't do anything better. We actually found a product that 
was already just an awful product, but the only solution. And then we just stepped in and did it way better, right? There's tons of these opportunities. How many desktop apps do you know that people still use? How many complex things do we still do in Excel, Google Sheets that can be turned into software, right? Those are the questions you should be asking yourselves are not, what is this completely crazy idea that I can come up with that will change the world? It's like, what can I just do better, you know? And sometimes that's simple as that, right? 600,000 authors have tried to use this software and have shot themselves in the face. This was me three years ago. Like, I used this software three years ago, and I was like, why would anybody ever use this? And then I look at this guy on a podcast, and he's like, we have 600,000 customers. I was like, what? I was like, that's crazy. And I'm like, there must be an alternative. No alternative, right? So one of the things I like to say is that even if that was a great opportunity, I would have never gone into this space if I wasn't a writer. Um, and the reason for that is startups are about longevity at the end of the day. The reason that MLK, Gandhi, and a lot of the people that we know today that were able to build these great audiences is they built themselves on top of the passion. You don't find something that's profitable and try to motivate yourself. You find something you're already motivated about, right? If you can't motivate yourself about things, make sure you're motivated about it first. That's a huge mistake that most people make, and it's an easy way to see which startups are going to last and which startups are going to fail. So this is my co-founder actually hitting me up, the first message he ever sent me before, and this was close to a year ago in April, which is pretty incredible. Um, actually took me a while scrolling through the messenger feed to get to it. Uh, <laughs> it's hilarious. And one of the things that's remarkable about, about this is that he came through something I was passionate about, right? I was passionate about this Facebook group, passionate about putting out these growth hacks. And he reaches out to me and says, I want to do the first LA chapter of the events that you've been doing up in SF. Let's make it happen. So I go and meet with him in LA. And from there, you know, the rest is history. And we clicked right away. I said, this guy is on the same wavelength I am. And next week, we quit our jobs and we started the company. And one of the things a lot of us try to do is we go and we search all over trying to find people who will fit our startup. We need to find people who will fit our passions first. I will hire someone who is passionate about what we do above someone who is more experienced every single time because you can't teach passion. They'll burn out, they'll work less hours, and they don't care. They don't care to innovate. They don't care to bring on more people to help your company. And as much as people think that's okay because they've worked at corporate companies that do that, and startups, that doesn't work. If the first 50 people aren't motivated, the next 500 people won't be motivated. And then we have Resonate right here, which is the startup, the original one that we pivoted into the software platform that we have today. So it's Resonate.ai, the AI software for writers. Hilarious. So have an abundant mindset. This is huge. So a lot of people talk about having an abundant mindset, but what does it actually mean? So I write tons of guides about growth hacking, and people say, why do you put out this material? You know, aren't you afraid that people are going to steal it, copy what you do, et cetera, et cetera, which is total bullshit. Like, I feel like everybody should know that, but not enough people know that for some reason. People still come to me and say, dude, someone's going to steal your idea. I'm like, please go away. Like, <laughs> um, and having an abundant mindset means one thing in particular. And I like to say it in this way, which I find quite hilarious. If you have thoughts in your head, you're actually dumber. And what this means is you are smart if you externalize things. You're dumb if you keep them up here so you can because you can only hold so many thoughts, right? You can't hold 20 thoughts at once. If you hold the same idea, the same, I'm going to start a Facebook group about sales for a year, you're not going to come up with any more great ideas. Get all your shitty ideas out there because we all have tons of shitty ideas and it'll give you the good ones, right? But you have to have an abundant mindset and you have to be very humble that no idea that you come up with is really going to change the world because no one started a great company by saying this idea is going to change the world. They're like, man, I really hope this works. I have no idea, right? That is literally how most great companies are started. And how they get to that point is they get all those shitty ideas out there. So this is a company that we work with over at Agency 
They're called Pina Farina. I know nothing about cars. My staff is super stoked about them. They're like Bugatti. Um, and how we landed them, if we're in the B2B world, right? So talking a little bit about software and B2C, now bringing it over to B2B, is that I spoke at an event a, two years ago, and they came through that event, right? And they came three months ago saying, ah, I saw you speak, speak at that event. I was like, you guys, aren't you guys like in Italy or something, you know? Like, why were you at my event in San Francisco? And they're like, and then I downloaded the BAMP Bible. And I was like, oh, really? Downloaded one of my books. That's cool. He's like, and then I went to my management and I said, you need BAMP. And my management said, what the fuck is BAMP? <laughs> I was like, I hope the story gets better. And he says, I said, they do growth hacking. And the management says, what the fuck is growth hacking? You know? <laughs> and so he's telling me this story of how he convinces his management to get on the phone with me. And I'm just going like, wow, this is crazy. That things you do you know, two years ago, three years ago, and all that rapport building comes back at the end of the day. This is one of the biggest companies we work with today, to say the least. And you never know, right? especially if you're working at high price retainers and you're in the B2B world, whether it's software selling something that's $5,000 a month, $10,000 a month, $15,000 a month, whatever it is, you have to have an abundant mindset to the max. That's why most people don't play in that game because they can't do that. So a little bit on hiring and I just have a couple more slides before I'll let you guys uh, get some stretching in. So you can't teach discipline. You can have a culture of discipline, which is expecting people to be at the office at 9 a.m., expecting people to lease work till 5 p.m., right? Culture of discipline. So you want to hire disciplined people. You never want to discipline your people. If you are disciplining your people, you've hired the wrong people. That means if you have to take someone aside the second time, say you're really messing up, you've hired the wrong person. You can't hire people and teach them motivation either. It's a huge mistake. One of the reasons I was able to grow is because I've read so much on management and just learned from the best, right? And that's what they taught me. And then I applied it the same way and it's worked phenomenally. And then just this week, we had someone who's, she's new to the company and I pulled her aside. It's her first week and she had aggravated three people. And I was like, damn, three people, that's a lot. You know, it's like, I was like, one, two, like three, like, come on. <laughs> so I pulled her aside. And I just tell everyone why I say, hey, we have a culture of discipline here, but we don't discipline people. This is what people say about you. And I know it's true just based on your personality. We need you to fix this. That's it. I love you. Let's rock and roll. Give her a fist pound. And that was it. Completely changed the attitude, right? But that's the only time I'll ever do that. And keeping the conversation very short because sometimes fewer words are much better than saying, these are all the things you're doing wrong. Most people know what they're doing wrong if you just tell them, right? And you're like, this is it, done. They can fix it. So this is our team today. It's not everybody. This picture was taken a couple months ago, but it gives you an idea. Um, and we have a pretty young team. We're growing really fast, very excited about our journey. And we're hoping to be ideally the fast growing company in LA this year, which would be awesome. And a lot of it is just hiring the right people. And that's one of the things that our community has helped with a ton. So almost 90% of the people who work for us have come from our community. Two years, two and a half years ago when I started it, I had no idea it would become the biggest recruiting pool ever for the company that I started today. But that's how life works, right? You do things you're passionate about, bring people together around them, and then when you, when you want to start a business, it makes it 100 times easier, right? And everybody's looking for, how can I come up with that crazy business idea? Just start and get your shitty ideas out there and try to attract people around your shitty ideas, right? That's all we got. And if you think you got a lot more, you're probably going to fail. So start there. And if you can start attracting people around an idea, you might have something, right? And keep going. So trust in the fact that you don't know everything. Get those ideas out there. And I believe in them. I believe in each and every one of you. <laughs> so take a jump and let's rock and roll. All right, we got a couple minutes for questions.
there should be no product that takes you a couple years to develop that you can't get MVP version out. Unless like, unless you're doing super, super advanced stuff or trying to build like a Tesla. Like I just don't see that happening. I would, so I'll give you an example, like Airbnb, you don't have to build a mobile app. You can just have an email list and say, hey, here's people who are interested in places in LA who come to LA frequently and want to book spots. And here's renters that I know who want to open their spots. One email list to validate it. Done, right? I think people try to make the validation process a little bit too complicated. Um, and depending on your price point, if you're selling something at like $50,000, right? It's a little bit different. That has a lot of risk in it, right? Um, what I would do is actually probably underprice your product at first and then sell it and just get them to the point where they're about to buy and be like, oh yeah, by the way, like this is the case. And they're like, oh, fuck you. And you're like, cool, but I got my validation. Like, that's right. <laughs> so one of my former um, bosses, he, so I was the head of growth for a company called About. And my boss was the former evangelist for Google Analytics. And super smart dude, that's a phrase he used to use. So I just stole that phrase from him. We're still good friends today, so he doesn't really care. Uh, go for it. So I use deep tease because I think I've read in a couple books too, but I don't know. Um, I like the phrase, people like the phrase. Oh, man, hey, you hey can Josh, do that. we're recording this, so could you summarize the question after it's oh, asked? Okay. No problem. So Thank how you. many times can you fuck up before the market's like, dude, you're going to jail? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, yeah, you can actually fuck up a ton and not go to jail at all. Like, it's pretty incredible the amount of times. That, so I've made a ton of mistakes. Like, I worked for eight failed startups. And you can say that each of those startups that raised money technically were pre-selling without any real validation, right? But pre-selling to, to pe investors, which is the worst thing you could do sometimes. And yeah, I mean, none of them went to jail. You, you know, you have founders wasting millions and millions of dollars and they're like, well, that just happened. Like, okay, now to go work at like a big company, right? So. Yeah, great question. So you asked, how do I find my motivation? So how I find my motivation is simple, right? I just do things I love doing. One is writing. I love dancing. I love doing yoga. Um, I love the sun. That's why I moved to Venice after living in San Francisco for so long. Um, and it's about doing enough things to where you find it, right? It's, there's no great answer for that. I like to say at first in life, you're sort of just dabbling around until something really just pulls you in and then you just go into it, right? But you have to dabble around enough. And I feel like some people in a stage of their life, you know, whether older or maybe even younger, um, sometimes they're like 30, you know, 40, and they just haven't done that dabbling, right? They've only worked something that's very vertical and they don't even really know what they love, right? They can't even identify one thing that they love besides like, like oh, I like going to movies with my friends. Or I like, go I have this friend who, uh, he likes going to bars. So he built an app for bars. And I was like, dude, no. <laughs> you know? like, besides that, like, you know, oh, man. Yeah, in the agency world, it's really interesting. So, oh, so just repeat the question. How do you focus on creating a premium experience for your clients? Um, so in the agency world, we actually don't have any salespeople to date. So we can actually pay our employees a lot more. So by starting with a community, it's actually afforded us to have more hands-on with our clients. It's really interesting because if you look at most agency models, it's almost half salespeople, right? And I always wonder, I'm like, man, it looks awful. 
And I just, I've never gone through that. So all I know is that we can pair people more and that's why we get better people and we can get better customer experience, right? Um, I also believe that people have to be passionate about what you do. And at an agency, it's super, super hard. Reason is, is like, okay, what is a bigger cause here besides me working with seven clients at once, right? It's hard for them to get passionate about something. So trying to figure that out is always very difficult. But having a community is definitely a blessing because it's given them a lot of purpose where I can talk about the company and I can give them shout outs. It's not a shout out on my Facebook where like two people like it, but sometimes I'll write a story about them and thousands and thousands of people will see. And then I'll have an employee come up to me and be like, hey, how come I didn't get a shout out yet? You know, love that stuff. Do we have time? Or <laughs> okay, you can explain it to me later. We'll have we'll drive. Hundred percent. So, one of the things that I notice about most people, especially LinkedIn content creators, is that they're very general. They're like this is some motivational stuff. And it's always about motivational stuff. What they don't realize is that's like super top of funnel, right? That where you actually make your sales is like, this is the hardcore technical stuff that you just read. And you're like, man, I really wish I could do that, but I'll never have time to do that. And I'm going to pay someone to do that, right? So being able to incorporate that into your video as well is going to do wonders for you. Grant, less people will see it, less people will engage with it, but that's what closes clients. Um, most people, I don't know why most people do it. It's because motivational videos are easier. They're like, Motivation Monday. Like, are you guys ready for this? You know? And I'm like, oh man, later that night, you should have come out with that technical video. Um, you had everybody paying attention to you. <laughs> so, question is, you know, how do I manage my time? Uh, so, we talked a little bit about this earlier. I actually go to bed at eight, I wake up at four. Um, I do yoga or I go to the gym and then I write for around, try to write for around three hours before any of my employees get in. And then employees get in and I work till seven um, usually. And I would say I'm doing a lot of traveling nowadays, so it makes it a little bit harder. Uh, but I am very, very strict about my time because time is all you have at the end of the day. And that's why, you know, as you grow older, you become I'm much more of a believer in sell before you build because you realize how little time you have left. And the last thing you want to do is make a mistake that you've already made eight times. <laughs> so we have, we have time for one more question. Ooh, um, gosh. So can I give two? I'm just gonna, so the question is, um, you know, best book recommendations. I'm not gonna say number one because best so that means I can say two. So we have the organized mind. So I got that one from probably my smartest friend. And that was around five years ago. He was actually giving a presentation like I am today, except it was on a memory. And I was like, this guy's a fucking genius. Like I got to ask him. Right. So I go up and I'm like, what are the books? Let me know. He's like, read this one. And I read it. And that's when I started to understand that you can only carry so many ideas in your head at once. And that's why it's so important to externalize them to MVPs. And then the second book that I actually just finished reading last week is called Good to Great. Good to Great is a fantastic book about management. It talks a lot about building off your passion and not trying to motivate people, not trying to discipline people, but getting those people who are already disciplined and motivated on board. Cool. All right. Give it up for Josh. <laughs> So, so Josh, just to, just to remind it, you know, everybody that, that came out here, your presentation was fantastic, but the, really the difference between you and everybody else is you just never quit. You said eight failed startups that you went through. <laughs> yeah. Eight failed startups. I don't suggest it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what, what, what do you think is also your special sauce? Just, you know, last thing, what separates you from everybody else? Because it's not unattainable. Everybody here grew up, you know, very similarly to you. So what do you think that is the one takeaway people could do and, and you know, just internalize and, and go forward with? So it's going to sound crazy, but I'm not an optimist. So most people who are optimists, it's like when Christmas comes, my startup is going to be killing it. And then when Christmas comes, their startup is not killing it. And they're like, fuck, they're like next Christmas. 
and then it doesn't happen, right? I'm just more of a believer in just persistence and process. And that's been super helpful. So that way I never get crushed. And then one super secret is I probably have the lowest standard for happiness. Like you can make the dumbest joke in the world and I'll probably laugh. So that helps me get through a lot of shit. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. One more round of applause. We've got two more really great speakers up next, but Josh, before you sit down, you're in Seattle. Can I get a picture with you? Let's do it. All right. <laughs>